This week on Waterways. Pink shrimp and Burmese pythons. In your bait bucket, on your dinner plate, in the channels and ponds that fringe the Florida Keys is an animal that shaped history. An animal that, 50 years ago, fueled the growth of one of Florida's busiest working waterfronts, pink shrimp. This little animal is teaching us that separate parts of South Florida are connected, that game fish in the Florida Bay and shrimpers in the Tortugas share a common fate and that how we manage our fresh water will influence animals in our salty bays and seagrass beds. The pink shrimp fishery in the Tortugas was one of the last big shrimp grounds to be discovered. Since the late 1800s, boats had been taking white and brown shrimp, cousins to pink shrimp, in the shallow waters along the Gulf and Atlantic coasts. By the 1930s, shrimping for brown and white shrimp was a modern and profitable business. What kept pink shrimp undiscovered was the habits of the pink shrimp themselves. White and brown shrimp are day shrimp. They're active during the day and that's when most shrimpers fish for them. In contrast, pink shrimp burrow in the mud and sand during the day. Drag a trawler over their grounds during daylight and you'll get few animals. At night, they leave their temporary burrows and skitter across the bottom to feed. As shrimp biologist and historian Ed Little relates, it was through a lucky accident that shrimpers discovered this fact. And in 1949, uh, the Salvador brothers from St. Augustine came to Key West because they'd heard the rumors that there were shrimp here, but no one could find them. And they managed to borrow a, a vessel of one sort or another and go out and look and look. They made at least two different trips in the autumn of 1949 looking for the supposed shrimp bed that was here. One of the stories that had probably interested them and thought, made them think there might be a shrimp bed here was not only the stories about the fishermen finding fish uh, with large numbers of shrimp in the stomach, but there was another story that the Navy, in doing depth charge work and explosive work, sometimes would, would just, you know, make an explosion and shrimp would float to the surface. Uh, they came down here in the autumn of 18, 1949, went looking for shrimp and couldn't find any. And they looked and looked, but they were doing it by shrimping with shrimp trawl nets during the daytime. Well, as the story goes, apparently one time they had a mechanical problem or some problem on the vessel and they couldn't get the net in until after darkness. And when they pulled the net up, it was full of beautiful, large, pink shrimp, as many as you could ever want. When word spread of the Salvador brothers' find, it drew hundreds of boats from the southeastern U.S. to Key West and the Tortugas. People called the pink shrimp pink gold, and the drive to Key West a pink gold rush. In the years that followed, successful shrimpers could afford new cars every year. The Key West waterfront grew to accommodate hundreds of slips and shrimp packing plants. Pink shrimp is, is one of the highest valued marine animals that, that you can get within the Florida uh, commercial fishing industry. Uh, the prices that the fishermen get for the product vary from year to year, so it's hard to put a set value on it. I can tell you that our grounds out here generally produce on average, over the uh, 30 or 40 years we've been keeping records, about six million pounds of shrimp per year with the heads on. And that will translate out to some sort of a value, perhaps to 18 to 20 million dollars. Again, that's all contingent on, on the, the world market for shrimp and, and things like that. But it is a rather important component of the commercial fishing economy of the Florida Keys. The harvests held on for almost 30 years. But starting in the early 1980s, harvests began to fall. Between 1982 and 1991, landings followed an almost steady decline from around 8 million pounds to about 3 million pounds. Shrimpers wanted to know why. So did scientists. The answer didn't seem to be overfishing on the Tortugas grounds themselves. So where was the problem? 
Scientists had few leads. In the late 1950s, scientists had caught and marked pink shrimp near the Buttonwood Canal in Everglades National Park. A few months later, one of the marked shrimp showed up in the Tortugas. This was proof that shrimp were moving between the Everglades coast and the Tortugas. Pink shrimp is a species that um, spawns in offshore waters, particularly in the Tortugas area. And then the uh, larvae and post larvae make their way back toward the coast to um, especially Florida Bay and especially western Florida Bay. And they spend their juvenile stage there. And uh, when they grow to a certain size, uh, they move out back out to the spawning grounds and, and then spawn themselves. Studies of other species of shrimp had shown that the success of the harvest often depended upon the flow of water from rivers and streams to the ocean. The only river upstream from the Everglades coast was the River of Grass, the Everglades itself. And the Everglades were in trouble. During the 1950s and 1960s, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers built more than 1,400 miles of canals and levees to harness the Everglades. As pumps and levees took over the job previously left to rainfall and gravity, less water reached shrimp nursery grounds in Florida Bay. Joan Browder tackled this problem. Her work suggested that less water in the Everglades in late summer and fall meant fewer shrimp in the Tortugas. By comparing the shrimp landing statistics and rainfall patterns and other things, people pretty much figured out that shrimp are very closely tied to the health of the South Florida ecosystem, particularly the quantity of fresh water. Not only the, the quantity of fresh water, but the timing of fresh water releases into the Everglades. This was important news, because at the same time that scientists like Browder were showing that the shrimp harvest was linked to water from the Everglades, other scientists were studying the diets of Florida Bay's game fish. When these scientists looked into the bellies of sea trout, redfish, and even sharks, they found fistfuls of pink shrimp. That's why we're, everybody's so concerned about the well-being of the Everglades National Park and the ecology of South Florida and the water flows and all, because that is a nursery up there for many, many of the baby shrimp that not only provide uh, a food supply for other animals, but also eventually migrate down this way to sustain a shrimping industry as well. Having established that a lack of water from the glades affected the shrimp harvest, Browder's next step was to figure out how. Were just a few areas affected, or the whole Florida and Whitewater Bays? Are there places that are shrimp nursery grounds during a wet year, but not during drought? Does high salinity make it more difficult for shrimp to survive and grow? A lack of fresh water from the glades makes the coast saltier. If areas of the bay become too salty, they might be inhospitable to pink shrimp. To test this theory, Browder collected 2,000 shrimp from Florida Bay and packed them off to a lab in Texas. There, the shrimp were divided into different tanks, some very salty, others nearly fresh. They found that shrimp in the lab survive in the largest numbers and grow best when the salinity is around 30 parts per thousand. Shrimp started dying in larger numbers when the salinity climbed above 40 parts per thousand. Salinity in the center of Florida Bay often climbs above 40 parts per thousand. Could the problem lie in the center of the bay? Because we can see that the biggest opportunities to improve uh, pink shrimp production with improved freshwater flow to Florida Bay would be in the interior part of the bay where we now get years and months, months and years of hypersaline conditions which are not favorable to the shrimp. And um, if we could have more fresh water going into the bay so that hypersalinity covers less area and uh, occurs less frequently and is of less duration, then we have a potential of greatly increasing the uh, the pink shrimp production, but we need to understand whether pink shrimp post larvae are getting into the central part of the bay because we know that the tidal amplitude slows, uh, decreases as you go from the western edge of the bay into the interior. So that's 
the focus of our, of our present work. To know whether improving the delivery of water to the center of the bay would give shrimp a boost, scientists needed to know whether they were getting there. The past four years of our work has focused on the post-larval transport to the bay, and that's why we have the channel nets out in uh, Whale Harbor, Indian Key, and, and uh, Panhandle Key. We also had channel nets up until just a few months ago for four years out in uh, Sandy Key Channel and um, Middle Key Channel and Conkey Channel in the west part of the bay. Tom Jackson, a biologist with the National Marine Fisheries Service, is looking for one-month-old creatures that float in from the Tortugas. Though the creatures he seeks are less than half an inch long, they hold the key to understanding how Everglades water affects everything from fish on Florida Bay Flats to trawling halls at the Tortugas. These creatures are an early life stage of pink shrimp. So far, scientists have found that most pink shrimp enter Florida Bay along its western edge. This was unexpected. Before this find, scientists had assumed that shrimp entered via creeks and channels through the Florida Keys. All of this new information is helping water managers decide where it is most important to restore South Florida's water. I think that the information that we're gathering about pink shrimp is valuable not only for um, helping to guide and evaluate uh, the uh, South Florida ecosystem restoration effort and the, and the modification of the water management system, but also to help uh, the uh, fishery managers better understand the, uh, the fishery species that they are managing. Water managers hope the restoration of the Everglades will restore shrimp to the numbers harvested in the 1950s and 60s. If managers can get the water right, perhaps pink shrimp won't get hit as hard as they did in the 1980s and early 1990s. Giant snake versus alligator. A headline from the grocery store tabloids? Hardly. This is happening in your backyard. The Burmese python, a giant snake from Southeast Asia, is roaming free in the Everglades, tangling with gators and feeding on smaller animals. Because this constrictor can grow to 20 feet or more and reach 200 pounds, people are paying attention. Like green men in the tabloids, this snake is an alien. It doesn't belong here. Um, and all of these uh, occurrences of big snakes, big exotic snakes, particularly Burmese pythons, uh, come from the pet trade. And they come from intentional releases from, uh, from owners, possibly breeders, uh, but in generally humans, people who have them as pets are involved in the pet trade and can no longer keep these animals and, uh, and they're therefore release them into wild areas uh, uh, like Everglades National Park or adjacent wildlands. National Park biologists Skip Snow and Lori Oberhofer are working to clean up the mess. During hot summer nights, they hunt the big snakes along the road in Everglades National Park. One method uh, that we have for catching uh, pythons is, is road cruising, which, as the name implies, we, we go out um, in the appropriate time of, of the year. In the, in the summertime, it's, it's at night, um, and drive the, the main park road slowly, looking for uh, pythons that are either using the road um, for its, uh, its heat advantage, for the thermal advantage that it provides, or they're, they're soaking up the, the heat that's retained by the, by the asphalt, or they're um, also looking for prey that might be concentrated as a result of the artificial high ground that the road provides. Either way, we're looking for uh, these pythons on the road, um, and when we come upon them, the, the idea is to, uh, is to get out before they disappear and, and, um, and capture them.
Got him, got him. Okay. We look for external parasites. We look for scars and evidence that uh, might suggest to us that they've been out in the wild for a long time as opposed to a recent um, release. Yeah, about a six foot, maybe seven. Yeah. Looks like a male. Yep, looks like a male. Feisty male. Very feisty. Looks in good shape. You got him okay? Mm-hmm. Don't see much for scars. He's got really sharp, recurving teeth, you can see. Oh, that's, that's a good shot on the teeth. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely don't want to get bit by one of these guys. Well, it's one for tonight and five for this month. Who knows how many more we'll find. I hope we find more. I hope we find some big ones. Summer evenings are hot and filled with blood-sucking mosquitoes. Nonetheless, Skip and Lori have managed to keep their concentration and have successfully caught all but one python that they have encountered. We also then on the inside look for internal parasites, um, take out the, uh, the, the major fat bodies and get a weight on that that gives us some indication as an indice of the general health. Um, obviously ensure that we have the, the, the sex of the animal correct, we examine the reproductive organs to see how mature they are, get some sense of, of how quickly they mature or how long it takes for them to mature. Determining the age and sex of the snake will give Skip and Lori clues about the snake population. Are they multiplying quickly? Unfortunately, over the last eight years, the news hasn't been good. But what we've learned here seems to suggest that in the mid-90s, like 96, 97 maybe, was the first time we saw um, size classes other than just large mature snakes that, that might have been recent releases from people who could no longer keep them. There were reliable sightings frequently from year to year and across a number of months of all of the major size classes, big mature, sexually mature animals, um, small, young of the year, uh, even close to hatchling size, and then all those animals that are in between that are more or less sub-adults. Finding hatchling-sized snakes is a good indication that the snakes are breeding. According to biologist Snow, this could be bad news for native wildlife in the Everglades. These uh, are top-of-the-line top predators that eat um, uh, native animals. Uh, they eat native mammals and, and birds, um, and in that, in that sense, they also compete with our other top-of-the-line predators, be they bobcats um, or the Florida panthers. They compete, uh, these pythons compete for food items with um, our native wildlife. If eating native animals and competing with native predators isn't bad enough, the Burmese python also competes for habitat with native species. Snow speculates that pythons might be stealing prime burrowing places from the native snakes like the native eastern indigo snake. But that's not all. There is always a concern with non-native animals about the, the transmission of, of exotic diseases. Uh, we do know that pythons and, uh, and boas uh, have in captivity uh, a kind of disease called inclusion body disease, IBD, which is uh, fairly lethal within captive collections. And um, there is some thought about whether or not that can be uh, show up in the wild, whether it can be transmitted to native snakes. Much of what Skip learns about the animals happens after they are dispatched. In accordance with the humane standards set by the American Veterinary and Medical Association, the snakes are euthanized. Skip then examines the body to determine what the snakes are eating and if they're carrying any disease. If the python's habits in its native Southeast Asia are any indication, it is an adaptable animal able to live in many places in South Florida. This makes it hard to get rid of. And the surprising thing about Burmese pythons is they, they occur in a fairly wide range of, of habitats, both in, in elevation from, from sea level all the way to 3,000 meters, and as well as in, in, uh, in, in somewhat in, in climate, um, occurring in, in dry mountain forests and, and tropical mangrove forests, and they seem to move freely, according to observations, in, in, uh, in salt water, um, as well as they're very comfortable in fresh water. They, while not fully aquatic, they, they, they do well in, in fresh water. Um, Everglades, South Florida, for that matter, much of Florida, fits very well within that. 
Further adding to the problem is the lack of animals in South Florida that eat the python. If these pythons survive their first year, they become almost invincible because of their enormous size. A one-year-old python can reach six feet in length. Perhaps only one animal in South Florida can handle an animal this big. Uh, we do have two observations of, an, of encounters between alligators and pythons, both of which are somewhat inconclusive. We don't know if the, if the snake actually did die or, uh, and or was eaten by the alligator. There's some indication that at least the alligator had the upper hand. Because the snake might be hard to eradicate, Skip and Lori are adding to their toolkits. Lori is training a snake-sniffing dog. Skip is working with people overseas to design an effective trap. The, the effort of, of going out and, and road cruising is one technique that we use in order to try and catch them. We're also uh, working on, on trap designs. We've been communicating with people who have worked on the brown tree snake in Guam and the kinds of traps that they've used. I've communicated with researchers in, uh, in Borneo who, uh, who trap on a regular basis a related species called the reticulated python. And um, so we're trying to get some sense of, of, a, of a good uh, usable trap and a trap design and a method to deploy it. But Skip admits that few of these tools will be effective if people don't make the right choices. From 1989 through 1997, the United States imported 18.3 million live reptiles, representing 645 different species. In 1997 alone, people in this country imported more than 1.7 million reptiles. Skip, Lori, and others at Everglades National Park have started a campaign to reach these pet owners before they travel the back roads of South Florida, looking for a place to drop their unwanted pets. The campaign is called Don't Let It Loose. It aims to teach people about the damage they do to our wild lands and waters when they set loose an animal that doesn't belong here. Once they take on the responsibility of, of a, an exotic animal or a pet of any kind, um, they have a responsibility um, to it and should be a responsible pet owner. Um, think about what they're, what they're buying beforehand um, so they don't find themselves in, in, a, in a situation where they have to um, uh, dispose of it prematurely. If they do, um, the, above all, don't release it. Find alternatives. Take it back to the shop where you bought it. Try and find someone else who, who can take it from you. Obviously try and sell it. Skip and Lori advise people that by not dumping their pets into the wild, they can do a good turn for South Florida's parks and wildlands. They hope school children and adults will spread the slogan, don't let it loose, to their friends and neighbors. And they hope people will remember, if you love South Florida, don't set your pet free.